It has been a difficult three years for the small northern nation of Iceland. In fact, as the country's president put it recently, if you were to try to create the perfect laboratory experiment to test the resilience of a nation, you could hardly do better than what Iceland has experienced. The country was the first to be hit by the global financial upheaval. The failure of its banks led to a complete economic collapse. One year later, a volcano with an almost unpronounceable name erupted, covering the country in ash. Then, six months later, came a second massive eruption. As President Olafur Grimson put it, it was a sobering experience, and that is an understatement. So it is no small achievement that three years after it all began, Iceland appears to be emerging from the worst of the crisis. Unemployment is down to levels that many other European nations would envy. Investment is returning. And the economy is projected to grow by as much as 3% this year. What makes this all the more remarkable is the way Iceland has done it. Instead of following the standard formula of severe austerity and debt repayment, Iceland did pretty much the opposite. Olafur Grimson is the president of Iceland. This morning he's in a studio in Reykjavik. Mr. President, good morning. Good morning. Pleasure to have you on our program. You have said that the collapse, the financial collapse in your country threatened your entire democratic and social system. How so? It was uh, an extraordinary experience to witness how the collapse of the banks, their financial crisis, seemed to be in the process of breaking up the very strong social cohesion which has characterized Iceland uh, for centuries. In our country, this led to continuous protests in the streets, even at the height of winter, riots in front of the parliament and the prime minister's office. And from one day to another, as we came into January of 2009, What I feared uh, every morning when I woke up was not that we wouldn't be able to deal with the economic consequences, but whether what was happening to our political and social and democratic system uh, would uh, completely split apart and we wouldn't be able to put it together again. How far away from the collapse of that social cohesion you talk about do you think the country actually was? Well, it's very difficult to say. Uh, We had the moment in the middle of the night in January where there was a a big crowd outside the prime minister's office demonstrating and the police was guarding the prime minister's office with shields and hamlets and uh, the crowd started throwing rocks at the police uh, officers uh, and the policemen. And then it seemed that Uh, perhaps the prime minister's office would be uh, invaded. But then all of a sudden, uh, a small group uh, came out of the crowd of demonstrators and put themselves in front of the uh, police force. Uh, So the stones that were being thrown would hit uh, fellow protesters. And and many of us believe that if these individuals, uh, 15, 20 of them or so, had not at that moment uh, decided that enough was enough, uh, nobody could have predicted what would have happened during that night. And nothing nothing like this has ever happened in Iceland no, before? No, no, never, never, ever, never, ever. So, as I have said to many, both financial leaders and political leaders in other countries, what all of this demonstrated is that uh, banks, uh, financial institutions, those who operate in the financial markets, both nationally and globally, they carry an enormous political and democratic and social responsibility because their actions on their own can break down our democratic and political system. So the theory, which was very popular from the 1980s onwards, so that somehow the market was supreme, and if you allowed the market uh, to go ahead full force, uh, the rest of society and our political system would somehow take care of itself. What we witnessed in Iceland, that this was turned on its head, 
that the failure in the market threaten the breakdown uh, of our entire uh, political and democratic system. And that is a very important lesson for those who have educated uh, the superiority of the market forces without taking into consideration the consequences that we are now witnessing. But fortunately for us in Iceland, uh, we were wise enough somehow early on, perhaps due to these events that I have just described, to realize that this challenge, this crisis, was not just an economic crisis. It was also a fundamental political and social and democratic challenge. Right. And I think one of the reasons why many European countries, and perhaps even the United States, and Britain are still facing these enormous uh, financial and economic challenges that uh, we are now seeing uh, every day, every week, every month, is that it's only very recently that the leaders of Europe and the United States have solely faced, have, have squarely faced it, that this is also a profound uh, political and democratic challenge. Mr. President, let's talk about the the uh, remedies that Iceland undertook. The the economic orthodoxy of the day says that the standard prescription for economies in trouble facing the challenges that you did was severe austerity, slashing government spending, bailouts if necessary of financial institutions. How much of of that did Iceland in fact do, or did you reject all of that? I think it is illustrative to perhaps uh, divide uh, the Icelandic response or, or the Icelandic way into three uh, different dimensions. Uh, the first was what I have just described, that we uh, defined the challenge not just as an economic challenge, but also as a profound political and social and democratic challenge. So we instigated uh, various measures to deal with this uh, political challenge. We established a commission to, estab to uh, examine the failure of the banks, the corporations, uh, and uh, political institutions in our country. We appointed a special uh, prosecutor's office, which became the largest judicial entity in our country. We even set in motion examination of uh, our constitution, uh, as well as various other legislative reforms that were enacted uh, following uh, the financial collapse. So the first dimension is to treat this uh, as a profound challenge uh, to society and the political system. The second dimension is that in various financial and economic measures, we went, as you mentioned, against the prevailing orthodoxies. Uh, we, for example, uh, did not pump public money into the banks. These were private banks, so we allowed them to fail. Uh, those who had lent money to these banks had to take the responsibilities of having operated uh, in the free market. We let uh, our currency, the krona, be devaluated uh, strongly. We instigated budgetary measures uh, that tried to shield those who are the poorest or, or uh, faced uh, biggest difficulties because of their, uh, their social status. And we uh, enacted many other measures that uh, were contrary to the traditional recommendations uh, by experts or international institutions. And it was very interesting that at a recent uh, farewell conference that was held in Reykjavik because the IMF program is over, IMF has now left Iceland because of the success uh, of our recovery, the IMF uh, leadership, which uh, participated in this conference, acknowledged that uh, dealing with Iceland had been a very interesting and fundamental learning process for the IMF. <laughs> but, Mr. President, the IMF at the time warned Iceland that you would never again be able to borrow if you didn't bail out the banks. And, the, and politicians in Europe said the same thing. The rating agencies demanded that the government honor the debts of the banks. Well, uh, all of this is true. Uh, with respect to the rating agencies, uh, I have to tell you that I still think they have a lot to answer for because uh, when we look back at why we didn't take measures in 2006 and 2007 or early 2008, 
when some experts were warning us uh, about the banking system, the rating agencies, all of them, Moody's, Standard & Poor and Fitch, all gave the Icelandic banks a clean bill of health, even a, an excellent uh, certificate. Uh, so the fundamental question with respect to the rating agencies is that if they were so wrong in the years leading up to the banking crisis, why are they suddenly right uh, now? But you are right. Uh, we uh, did not follow uh, these uh, traditional measures that are in fact still uh, these very days being pushed uh, in various European countries. And that came out very squarely in what I call the third dimension of the Icelandic response. That in this very difficult uh, dispute with Britain and the Netherlands, uh, where they demanded that the people of Iceland should be formally responsible for the debt of a private Icelandic bank that operated in Britain and the Netherlands, uh, I decided, following a strong national demand, to put that to a referendum, to let the democratic will of the people be superior to the financial interest of the market. And when I took that decision in the beginning of 2010, it went against not only the majority in my own parliament and what the government had decided, but every government in Europe was telling me that that was wrong. That the, that the financial market, the financial markets should be supreme in confrontation with the democratic will of the people. But I decided to go the other way. There were a lot of people who predicted that that would be the downfall of Iceland. Uh, we would be isolated in the world. We will become uh, the Cuba of the North. But the fact of the matter is the people of Iceland twice were able to exercise their democratic will. And now Iceland is coming out of this crisis and establishing recovery earlier and more effectively than other European countries. There are two elements about that. First of all, there was a bill passed. You refused to sign it, didn't you? And you decided to go to the people in a referendum. Yes. Even though Brown in the UK threatened to freeze uh, Iceland's assets in that, in that country. He's not a very popular man, I take it, if he ever shows up in Reykjavik. <laughs> well, Gordon Brown... Uh, God bless his political memory, uh, will be uh, long remembered in Iceland uh, after he has been forgotten uh, in Britain because uh, <laughs> we we have a long historical memory. We, we, we still remember those Vikings who traveled uh, to what's now Canada a thousand, thousand years ago. But you're right. I mean, they exercised extraordinary measures against Iceland. They even invoked the, uh, evoked the terrorist legislation uh, against Iceland, put Iceland on the list with Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, even if we were a founding member of NATO, uh, paid out of the banks without asking us and then decided to send the bill to Iceland. And if we did not pay, they tried to use their position within the IMF board to uh, block uh, the uh, IMF program for Iceland. It was an extraordinary display throughout 2009 of using sheer force uh, against our country. My guest this morning is Olafur Grimson. He is the president of Iceland. He is in a studio in Reykjavik, and we're talking about the remarkable recovery of his country after the financial collapse. Mr. President, what what was it in your in your feeling, in your gut, actually, that told you that you could not sign a bill bailing out the banks. Why did you find that so repugnant? Well, there were really two fundamental strands uh, in my analysis. One was that uh, the European financial system was based on allowing uh, private banks to operate uh, all over Europe. And if we suddenly started to introduce the rule that if they failed, they could sell, send the bill to ordinary people, uh, fishermen and farmers and doctors and nurses and others, it would be tantamount to privatizing the profits and letting the bankers uh, become extremely rich if they were successful, but then sending them a signal that if they failed, they could send the bill back to ordinary people. And that was not only fundamentally unfair, but it would also be contrary to the fundamental principles uh, of the free market. And then 
in addition to that, uh, the financial burdens that uh, was involved in that first agreement threaten the very economic sovereignty of my country uh, in the coming decades. But in addition to that, and that was perhaps the core of it, you could analyze it financially and economically backwards and forwards as many people did. But when all the complicated analysis had been swept away, I was left with a fundamental choice between what was interpreted as the paramount financial interest of the financial markets in Europe with respect to Iceland, and on the other, the democratic will of my people. And I came to the conclusion that our society, like Europe or the Western world, is more about democracy than it is about financial market. If we start saying that financial markets are more important than democracy, we are, in my opinion, entering into a very risky journey with respect to Western values and what we are all about. And looking at Europe uh, these very days, where the interest of the financial markets have in many cases been deemed to be supreme, I think people have forgotten that Europe's most important contribution to the world is not the free market system, it's democracy and human rights. We have countries in Asia and other parts of the world that are excellent uh, market economies, but they have very little democracy. One of, one of the more striking things that you, you've talked about is that while Western governments... Western democracies were pressuring you to pay off the debts of those private banks. The one country with which you were able to have a constructive dialogue was China. How do you explain that? Well, that's a very interesting case. Uh, and uh, uh, in those first months, uh, in October of 2008, November, December, and into January 2009, we were faced with a situation that all the European Union countries had come together to support Britain and the Netherlands and their request that Iceland would shoulder this extraordinary debt burden of a single private bank, a debt burden of the scale, to give you an example, because many people have not realized this, a debt responsibility of the scale that if you take into account the relative size of the British and the Icelandic economy would have been equal to the people of Britain sheltering the responsibility for almost a trillion dollar. A trillion dollar because of the operation of, a, of one bank. Right. That is almost the, the complete size of the uh, European Emergency Fund that people have been talking about in, in recent weeks. So we were faced with this situation that... Uh, we faced uh, uh, a unified uh, uh, front of European countries uh, with small exceptions like the Faroe Islands and our friends in Poland who were pressurizing us to, uh, to bow to the uh, claims from Britain and the Netherlands. And with respect to the United States, which had been a traditional ally of Iceland for a long time, we simply faced a situation that they didn't care that they described in private conversations that they were simply sorry, but there was nothing they could do. So where could we turn? So I started in cooperation with the prime minister of the time and our foreign minister at the time uh, to instigate a dialogue uh, through a letter and then uh, discussions, uh, letter to the president of China, Hu Jintao, and the discussions with their ambassador. And what followed was an extraordinary sophisticated dialogue that we conducted with the Chinese leadership for the following uh, four or five months, which ultimately led <coughs> to an agreement between the Central Bank of Iceland and the Central Bank of China and a very high-level delegation by one of the major Chinese leaders to Iceland uh, <coughs> sometime later, where they expressed uh, support in terms of investment uh, and loans and so on and so forth. And as an observer <coughs> of international politics for many decades and a former professor, 
I found it remarkable, uh, the level of sophistication that the Chinese leadership showed in this dialogue, as well as the goodwill uh, towards Iceland, when, when all our traditional friends and allies were either simply not interested or showed uh, uh, strong hostility. I'm wondering, though, in the fallout of all of this, Iceland's position today, a a projected growth rate of something like 3%, but how difficult is it for your government to go into the market to finance debt on the international markets? Are investors turning away from Iceland or they're coming back? No, 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 no. You could even say our problem has been that there's been uh, too much interest in investing in Iceland. Uh, How is that? (laughs) And and with respect to the financial markets, uh, uh, we had a great success uh, earlier this year when the Icelandic authorities raised money in the international financial market. So uh, all the indicators in the financial markets uh, in uh, the last year or year and a half uh, have been uh, very positive. Uh, Rio Tinto is now investing in Iceland for half a billion dollars. It was, in fact, the first uh, international investment that Rio Tinto decided to engage in uh, following the international financial crisis. Similarly, foreign companies are investing in data storage centers. And the reason is, uh, or the reasons uh, are perhaps uh, uh, a number of, uh, of the reasons. One is, of course, that Throughout this crisis, uh, the country and the nation has demonstrated uh, considerable capability to uh, uh, return to uh, a successful economy in the long run and and show the responsibility that uh, foreign investors appreciate. But above that, uh, the strong natural resources of Iceland, the clean energy, the water, uh, the ocean resources, as well as the... uh, Uh, the extraordinary nature that Iceland has to offer, all of this has helped us together with the IT sector and the high-tech sector to strengthen our exports uh, in a formidable way. And that is one of the reasons why we are coming out of this crisis in a relatively short time. And let me also mention other things that your listeners might find interesting. Uh, After the banks collapsed, we suddenly realized that these big Icelandic banks, like banks in America and and Europe, are no longer traditional banks. They have, in fact, become high-tech companies, hiring engineers, mathematicians, uh, computer scientists, and many others. And when they collapsed, there was suddenly a wealth of talent available in the market. So IT companies and high-tech companies uh, who had had uh, extraordinary growth potential before but couldn't realize it because uh, uh, the banks were outbidding them for these uh, qualified people suddenly could now hire engineers and computer scientists and mathematicians and designers and programmers and so on. So uh, almost the entire IT and high-tech sector in Iceland has in the last two years or so had a much success, more successful period than in the years leading up uh, to the banking crisis. So the, the lesson of that is that uh, if, your, if your nation wants to be competitive in the creative sectors of the 21st century economy, IT, high tech, and so on, a big banking sector, even a very successful banking sector, is in fact bad news for the creative sectors of our economies. Mr. President, as you said, Iceland is a, it's an integrated society. It is politically coherent and cohesive. It is a small nation. Do you think that what Iceland did in the crisis and coming out of it is applicable in places such as Greece and Italy and Ireland and Spain? Would what you did work within the Eurozone? Well, it depends how you look at it. Of course, uh, the difference is uh, we had our own currency, uh, we still have, whereas they are bound uh, by the framework uh, of the euro. Uh, But in addition to that, as we have mentioned in our discussion, uh, we uh, decided to go against many of the uh, financial orthodoxies that are still prevailing within the eurozone. 
it's right, Iceland is a small country. We are not a big nation. But we are a highly advanced uh, Western society. And I don't uh, accept the argument that because Iceland is so small, <clears throat> it was possible for us to recover <clears throat> Sorry, after the crisis earlier than others. On the contrary, you can look at Iceland as a kind of laboratory where some of these conflicts and the challenges and the measures uh, and the recovery policies come out more clearly uh, and in a more transparent way than in a more complicated society. So what has succeeded in Iceland uh, should also be successful in other countries. But I have consistently had the position that I am not going to offer other countries concrete advice. What I can describe is what we have done in Iceland, what are the lessons we have drawn, uh, what are the primary elements uh, in our difficult journey, and it has been difficult, in, uh, no doubt about it, in the last three years. And then other people have to draw conclusions uh, for their countries. Let me ask you finally, Mr. President, we live in an era of, as you said, and certainly since the war, market dominance, where capital is is preferred over labor, uh, where financial uh, financial workings are more important than productivity, it seems. Do you think that the world is going to turn around and, and come away from that, that way of thinking? Well, I hope so. Uh, we have learned many lessons uh, from this difficult experience here in Iceland. And uh, all these lessons uh, point in the direction that you have uh, just described. But this crisis, as I have tried to describe to you, has also brought out a fundamental dilemma for our Western societies. And that is this. Is democracy more important for us than the financial markets? And this is perhaps the core of the challenge that you are witnessing these very days in Europe. It's also a strong element in the uh, difficult situation that the United States still finds itself. We somehow have to find a way where democracy can prevail, even if, even if we have to take our societies out of a profound financial crisis. If we start sacrificing democratic elements of our societies for financial expediency, we have, in my opinion, entered a very dangerous journey. Mr. President, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. It's a, thank it's you. a pleasure thank to meet you. you on the radio. Thank you. Thank you. Olafur Grimson is the president of Iceland, and this morning he was in a studio in Reykjavik. You are listening to the Sunday edition across Canada on CBC Radio 1 and across North America on Sirius Satellite 159. My name is Michael Enright.